Great. Well, uh, many thanks. It's, uh, it's really a great honor to receive the Carnegie Vattler Peace Prize on behalf of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, or HD, as we are known. Um, HD was created by the, uh, the Red Cross a quarter of a century ago to undertake quiet, informal diplomacy in the service of uh, peace. It was designed to be a low-key organization, not uh, secret, but uh, discreet. And that, for the most part, is, uh, is how we have operated ever since our first project, which uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, to produce a cessation of hostilities agreement in the Aceh War in Indonesia. And much of the time, therefore, we don't do public events. Uh, but we couldn't resist this one. Um, and we thank you for that, because the Peace Prize is really an inspiration to me and to my colleagues. And we will think of it and of the values and motivation behind it uh, when we next find ourselves in a dark place, which is often. It will be uh, a light for, for us. Thank you very much. I should also say that as a part of trying to keep a uh, low profile, we do try when we do speak on the public record not to say anything too uh, interesting. So I apologize if that's a little bit the case today, but I offer the compensation that I will be quite brief. Um, so the, the prize is being conferred in, in the Hague, the city uh, where synonymous with the global effort to advance uh, the cause of justice, including or especially in, in, in war. And I have myself come to the Hague many times to give testimony in international criminal cases. So being in the city of peace and justice, I thought I would say a word about that intersection of peace and justice in the uh, work of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. And, you know, it's an old debate, which I won't add too much. It's uh, Sophocles Antigone uh, was confronted with the problem two and a half thousand uh, years ago, and it remains um, actively debated. And there is an easy way out uh, to say that there is no tension between peace and justice, no contradiction. But I have to say that my whole life has brought me to the feeling that there is uh, a tension that needs to be discussed. Um, almost 30 years ago, in April of 1993, uh, Serb forces in Bosnia surrounded Srebrenica with a population of about 40,000 Bosnian Muslims or Bosniaks. Seeing the hopelessness of their situation, the Bosniak leaders in Srebrenica entered into discussions with UNHCR about the possibility of an evacuation across Serb-held territory to safety. UNHCR then contacted the local Serb commanders uh, who agreed. And the first convoy of vehicles was prepared, and the first evacuees said their goodbyes, and the first vehicles began to move. And then it was stopped. The Bosnian government in Sarajevo, as well as many foreign friends, said that the evac evacuation deal was unacceptable for UNHCR to broker uh, a deal with Serb generals and desperate Bosniaks to remove a whole population contrary to the most basic precepts of international humanitarian law was just unacceptable. And a deal like that would be nothing more than facilitating ethnic cleansing, they claimed. So there could not be any fair deal or any real free choice in a situation like that. UNHCR, they felt, must stop the evacuations. And so they did stop the evacuations, and the people stayed. And uh, because of where we are, I will say that um, it was at that point that the United Nations decided to ask the government of the Netherlands to deploy Dutch Blue Helmet troops to Srebrenica to offer some level of protection to the people, who, because there was not going to be that evacuation agreement, would have to stay there. And um, uh, the Canadians and the Swedes were also asked to take on this role, and they both refused because they said it was militarily impossible. And Kofi Annan, uh, my boss, the uh, then under UN Undersecretary General for Peacekeeping, 
told the UN Security Council that the job couldn't be done without a much bigger and more heavily armed force. Nevertheless, the agreement was stopped, the people stayed, and a very light force uh, was put there at the bottom of a valley greatly surrounded by a very heavily armed Serb army. And when two years later the Serbs finally closed the noose in the summer of 1995, many of those people who would have been evacuated in 1993 were nowhere to be found. Most of them were among the 30,000 people who had made it across Serb-controlled territory to safety in Bosnian government territory, either on foot, mainly at night, amid uh, unimaginable fear and danger, or bust out by the conquering Serbs as an act of ethnic cleansing. But many thousands could not be accounted for. Nobody knew for sure how many, maybe up to 10,000. I was working in Sarajevo at the time and was dispatched by the United Nations as part of the effort to find out what had happened to those unaccounted for people. One of the places I stopped on the way to Srebrenica was a tiny Serb-controlled hamlet called Kravica, just outside of Srebrenica. There I found a nondescript agricultural warehouse. It was a cement rectangle, not big, uh, roughly the size of this room, in fact. And there were uh, bullet casings outside on the ground. So I went in and it was empty. Uh, it was empty except that on all six internal surfaces of the warehouse, the four walls plus the floor and the ceiling were the smeared remains of human tissue on every face. What had not been removed when several hundred bodies had been bulldozed out and the place hosed down. Mainly, what you saw was just red and brown smudges, some with bits of hair still attached, and some chips of bone and tissue in the corner, which gave a sense of what had happened. 700 people had been locked in Fire had been directed through every, women, every window and door, and the bodies had exploded. I have had a lot of time, more than a quarter of a century, to think about what I saw that day. And one of the things I have asked myself is how many of those people would still be alive, would have escaped the crime of genocide, if the deal brokered by UNHCR had gone ahead in April of 1993. And how strange it was that those who had blocked the deal had done so in the name of justice, in the name of not being handmaiden to the crime of ethnic cleansing. And now I work for an organization which is involved with similar deals which is being honored here today for that work. Not theoretically involved in such deals, but actively facilitating. For example, and I was going to use this example even before I knew that the Deputy Prime Minister, who knows this story rather well, <laughs> uh, would be here. Um, but in April of 2018, which happened to be, by the way, exactly 25 years, exactly almost to the day, uh, after the doomed Srebrenica deal, something a little similar happened in eastern Huta in the suburbs of Damascus, except it had a totally different outcome. Eastern Huta, a little like Srebrenica, was surrounded by forces of the Syrian regime. Much of the population at that moment was living underground. 70% of the population was living underground but even that didn't save them. Sarin gas was used. Children were killed, quite a large number of them. People trapped inside wanted to escape, to, to save their lives. 
a deal was made, three deals, in fact, and HD had a role in those deals, in particular in the first of them with the, the Filak al-Rahman. And then, once these deals were made, an enormous number of people who simply wanted to make their home where their homes were, were evacuated, over 100,000 people, across territory held by the Syrian regime to the opposition stronghold of Idlib, where, by the way, most of them still are to this day and still exposed to, to the war and close to the front line. And so, as in the case 25 years before, there were denunciations that outsiders had helped the attacking forces to cleanse the area uh, that those forces had terrorized in violation of the laws and customs of war. Uh, right or wrong, uh, just or unjust, and would we have done it uh, again? I would say two things first to those good questions. First, there is no absolute answer, I think, and second, the views that matter most would certainly have to come from those who were evacuated. But somehow that can't be an excuse for not taking a position as the questions arise. We were there when it was all unfolding, uh, Nier and Amir and people you know, Deputy Prime Minister, and either we had to do something or we had to do nothing. There was no third way there. And one question came up a lot. It was the question of informed consent. If the word consent can refer to something that is done as the only alternative to being killed. Did the three groups of Huta negotiators, for example, know the risks of what they were getting into? Did they know that we as a third party had no capacity to protect them at all? if the regime reneged on the deal. They, of course, knew the regime much better than we ever could, and they chose to take the risk to, to proceed, given the alternatives, or to be precise, given, given the lack of alternatives. And we, in, on the strength of their wish to proceed, chose that we would also continue our role as go-between or as enabler. We stood with them, but somehow, simply passing responsibility to the victims is not uh, a way out of the moral dilemma, of course. What if the regime had stopped those buses and started killing those on board? I have to say for the record that the regime did not stop anybody. All, every 12 people were killed, but they were all killed on arrival in Idlib, I, I, I believe. Um, would we have said, if the regime had reneged, well, they knew the risks, and, and they chose to take a chance. Would that have really been enough of an answer for us, uh, morally? How much did we really know about the level of risk and when we agree, agreed to play our role? It didn't happen, so it sort of ended happily, but it could easily have been otherwise. Those are questions that we did ask ourselves, never arriving at perfect answers, but still feeling that despite the confusion in the region for doubt, we had an obligation to press on. I have spoken to my UNHCR colleagues who were in the same position in 1993, and they do believe that they should have pressed on at that time. What we did not ask ourselves very much, very explicitly during the Huta negotiations, but which demands an answer in, in this city of peace and justice, was about the deeper moral hazard. We have to ask it. Yeah. The moral hazard persisted even if there was on the, on the side of the evacuees something approaching informed consent. And there was, on our side, something approaching reasonable due diligence about the level of risk. There is still, after all of that, um, uh, an unasked question, and that is somehow the question from Srebrenica. Was our work helping the Syrian regime 
to complete a job that was fundamentally wrong. Could we, like UNHCR and Srebrenica a quarter of a century before, be accused of legitimating or even enabling a huge crime? And whose place is it to answer that question and to say which priority is greater? Looking back, I have tried to understand that conundrum wherever it arises, and I think of Katya and others here, Marina Domoshkina and my colleagues. Um, I like to think of that in terms of the primacy of the right to life. However much we wish it weren't so, at least as operators in the field, we feel there is a hierarchy of rights. At least at desperate moments, rights do get traded off one against the other. Because at any given moment, the right to life surely trumps the others. Some rights can still have at least some meaning if they are deferred, including justice. I uh, served as a witness to trials that took place, I think, 15 years after the, the victims were killed. But the right to life cannot be deferred and cannot be parsed. Now, HD is not an organization of, of moral philosophers or of uh, lawyers. We try above all to be practical people, but we are acutely aware that the moral and legal hazard are everywhere in our work. So we try in every agreement, not just this one in Eastern Huta, with its many dark echoes of Srebrenica, to be guided by the principles which I hope the trustees of this prize can concur with. And the first of these from which all others flow, which is in our name, is humanity. Our belief and our lived experience is that humanity does not allow us the luxury of not acting until all positive principles are aligned. The choices in war, and um, I thank uh, Minister Donner for raising the subject of the agreement just made between Addis Ababa and the Tigrayan rebels, because these questions yesterday, uh, which, which was also started as an HD initiative, because um, these questions arise there too. The choices are never between good and bad. The choices are almost always between bad and worse, or even between bad and death. So apart from our commitment to humanity, we eschew purism. We try to be guided by those actually involved in war or its victims who seek an end to violence through negotiations. But we do not advocate for peace at any cost. If the parties choose to fight on, Ukraine, for example, I acknowledge the presence of His Excellency the Ambassador here, has made it clear that they would fight to free their territory of invaders, even if a ceasefire in place were proposed today. And our role is to be ready to help the parties to any conflict when they themselves are ready. In that case, we would take the lead from Kiev. We can discuss with them what negotiations might reasonably be expected to bring, but the decision to try to settle a conflict by negotiation rests entirely with them. Our way of working involves moral compromises. We are impartial with the parties, even when the moral equities are not the same on all sides, from the first work I did on Srebrenica to the agreement concluded yesterday with respect to Tigray. We maintain confidentiality, even when it is a considerable burden to do so. I see, however, one of the people we are able to unload on is our board. And my, one of my bosses is standing right in front of me, so I was <laughs> sitting right in front of me, so I, I do seek some solace there. We can and do admire those who don't compromise on their principles at all, who, for example, those who are against war for any reason and will not fight or engage, or for those who will always side with the weak who suffer at the hands of the strong or always fight for the triumph of what is right. We can admire them, but we also are aware that there is inescapable moral hazard that pursues even them, even the most principled actors in the crucible of war and peace. Insisting on perfect peace can prolong the suffering. Insisting on confidentiality 
as the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which created HD, as the ICRC did with its knowledge of the Vansay Conference in 1942, that commitment to confidentiality, taken to its full extreme, can provide cover and did provide cover for the most terrible crimes. So we believe that there is a role, a small but important role, for a service of last resort, for an organization, a pragmatic, low-key organization, acceptable to all sides, which can convene those who, for whatever reason, want to draw a line under a violent struggle and to find a negotiated exit. Whether it is a terrorized population surrounded by genocidal enemies, or armed groups at the end of their road, or a failed invasion or a confrontation between great powers that has become, come too close to catastrophic escalation, there has to be room, we believe, whatever the rights and wrongs, for those who can, who can offer a space and ideas when the time has come to talk. We are infinitely grateful to all the governments which have supported HD's quiet work to play that role. We are grateful to the trustees of the Carnegie Vatler Peace Prize and to our dear Dutch board members, the late Ambassador Herman Schaper and to the brilliant Maritja Schaka, and to all those who have felt that in war there sometimes just has to be a way to find the lesser evil. On behalf of all of us at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, I thank you.